losing my thunder here, but my earth shattering news is I discovered a new biocontrol agent for Napa. Nice. <laughs> Two days ago. Is this cool or what? It is. I have an idea. I need Robert to stay for my idea. Huh? We're going to put in for a grant to NRD for three hundred thousand dollars. I get a thousand dollars or a hundred thousand dollars for his discovery. Robert gets a hundred thousand dollars. He's going to administer the program. <laughs> the university cuts off fifty, sixty grand because that's how it works. At least forty grand to do the work, and the work is going to be chipmunk habitat improvement project. <laughs> Okay, back to the serious part of this. <laughs> Revegetation, does it matter? I'll tell you right now, it depends on what you're doing. I listed a couple of things. For research, what do you think? Does it matter? Probably anybody that's a scientist is going to say yeah. How about for land management? I'll tell you right now, no. Land management is not based on data. If you cut somebody's grazing allotment, they're going to get a hold of their senator, and that's going to be the end of that issue. You also almost never see uh, the agencies publish anything because it's usually not up to snuff. How about permitting and baseline? You know what that means? That means like we're going to do, we're going to have a mine. You have to do baseline for permitting. That's really important because if you're the one that delayed a mine, I, I can't even imagine what they would do to you. That's, that's super important. How about timber sales? I know we don't have any more, but I've cruised a ton of timber. That's pretty important because that's the basis for what you put for bid. So it has to match up pretty close to what you get. Treatment effectiveness, that's kind of like research, yeah. And bond release, anybody know what that means? You know, bond a project, set aside money for the restoration at some future date if the company goes bankrupt or defaults, okay? Super important because now we're going to compare something to something else and it's going to have to be statistically valid and ecologically valid. So and there are certain areas where it really is important. Given a presentation like this, eh, not so important. Okay, what is the intention on a project? You guys know when. If they were building a new building at Tech, when would it get on the front page of the paper? Everybody get a brand new hard hat and a shovel, and that's when it would be in the paper, right? Mm -hmm. It wouldn't be when the cost down overruns and it's two years late and all that. That's when all the attention goes on the project. When should it be? Of course it should be long term. Now, your focus should be almost exclusively on the long term, but it is. I made this one up. Anybody know Latin? Omni, everything. Novum, new. Pro magnifico is wonderful. Everything new is wonderful. That's how it is. Now, Robert, his predecessor here, was only here for about a year. Oops, that was my fault. <laughs> I can't see too good with this mask. And <clears throat> we were having a Native Client Society meeting, which this person didn't attend. And all the buzz was about how this person was going to do this and help us and Native Plant Society. And I said, are they actually a member? Do, they're not here. I mean, do they care? And the answer was they couldn't have cared less. But they were new. That's the key thing. They were new. Well, this is on revegetation, just one aspect of restoration. So what to measure? Somebody tell me. Yeah, just in your own words, what's productivity? Well, as a farmer, I say tons per acre. I'm sorry? As a farmer, I say tons per acre. You were in the talk before for me. I kind of recognized you. You're the one that couldn't believe that plants put out root exudates to stimulate the microflora. And, and because of that, I gave that talk again, and I made a point of saying, now this may be hard to believe. But it's so beneficial to the plant to stimulate the microflora that it actually puts out photosynthesis. Let's say it starts with the sun and carbon dioxide and converts it into COH and organic matter. So productivity, how would you measure that, you think? Well, if you had an unlimited budget at a university, you could put up screens and measure CO2 and oxygen and stuff like that. But 
Usually we do it by harvesting, or in the slang we call it clipping. And <clears throat> I have a couple words that it's net because some of it's respired, okay? We're only getting the net. Primary, because we're not measuring the grasshoppers and the deer and the elk and the other things like that. It's above ground because we're not measuring the roots. Productivity. And I just put a conversion there, 2.2 pounds in a kilogram, 2.47 acres in a hectare. So if I said it was 1,000 kilograms per hectare, you would say, eh, it's about 900 pounds per acre, if those are the units you relate to. Okay, plant cover. This is a descriptive concept. We're not, it's not fundamental like productivity, and it's two-dimensional. So we're taking vegetation, whatever, and we're reducing it like we're looking down on it, so it's the amount of cover. The thing about cover is it's very convenient to measure compared to productivity, and it's almost always used, okay? Now there's two, there's a number of ways, but I'll just mention one or two ways to measure it. They used to measure with pins and the little points. When you're doing that, it's called point intercept, and the point should be dimensionless. A little sharp pin. And you won't see that anymore, so I'm not going to talk about that. And <clears throat> another way to measure point intercept is you have a kind of a periscope deal. So it's got two prisms in it. And it magnifies, like minus 6x, it has a cross here. And <clears throat> If we, let's say we were on linoleum instead of this rug, and the whole pattern was a bunch of little balls, okay? It would be very hard for you to estimate the cover of those, because there's a bunch of little balls all over, right? This would nail it. You look down that with this little cross here, it's pink, it's red, whatever. It would be great. When it comes out into the field, I'm going to show you one of the problems in a minute, and the other problem is, what about when the wind's blowing? You're looking through that six power magnifier, and the vegetation's going like this. It's like a bat chasing insects, right? So I asked the guy that made these one time. I dabbled with it, I didn't care for it. I said, can you, do you think you're accurate with that in the field? And he said, I think I'm consistent. Okay. Which is something, but there's limitations with it. The other way is canopy coverage. Oh. I'm going to, I forgot this, I want to send a couple things around. By the way, my, uh, my business card, it says, on the back, it says, as if it mattered. It's because I do everything as if it mattered. So to me, this class matters. Do you need something around? I thought you need to send something around. I am, but I want to, I'm going to show them. I'm just going to show you some of my favorite books. Can we start here? Is that okay? Rex Dobbenmeyer from Idaho Plant Communities. You immediately see the profound depth of his understanding of vegetation. He's dead. Um, <laughs> so well written. You know, you can always pull up a paragraph or a sentence out of somebody, what somebody wrote and fix it, right? Make it better. Because it's just one sentence in a book, right? Every time I go to paraphrase, Dr. Meyer takes me more words than he did. So the, I'm just pointing, if you, if you guys are interested in this, and you can send them around. Rex Dobbenmeyer didn't get along with R.H. Whitaker at Cornell. R.H. Whitaker, uh, back in the days of Linnaeus, we only had two kingdoms. What were they? I know you know this one. Plants and animals, yes, exactly, right? And he's the one that introduced Monera and recognized the fungi as separate in five, five kingdoms. Anyway, uh, he says more in two paragraphs on diversity. Then a whole book I got, which I didn't finish, it was so bad. R.H. Hmm. Whitaker, you should know his name. Here's the book we know. And you know, Robert, wouldn't you agree, most books you never look at again, I mean. Yeah, and, just you know, a you know, the world's cool like dust. <laughs> this is Bill Grimes, Plant Strategies and Vegetation Processes. If you're in, in this kind of work, you had better pick this up. Uh, he divides plants into riverelles, those are the weedy species, competitors, and stress tol tolerators, which is a pretty good way to look at how the plants make a live. How many are interested in diversity? One or two. 
I would risk. Did you read this, Robert? Rosen Spikes? Yeah. You can see I got things stuck all over it. Good. If you're interested in that, a lot of original thinking in that. This is Chuck Bonham. I think he's dead now, too. This is the, the best book, the only book that probably is Measurement of Terrestrial Vegetation. I'm going to start quickly about stuff, but this is the book to have for a reference. I got to tell you, I don't think it's great, but it's the only one I know of. It's not bad. What can be left? Ah, another one on diversity. Excellent, excellent way of putting all the ways in the diversity together. Advances need logical research. Okay, okay. <clears throat> so, there's other things you could measure. How about density? That's, you know what that is, right? That's the number of individuals per area. Does that sound pretty simple? I mean, we can go out there and set out a plot and measure those trees, right? What do you think? Unambiguous? Maybe you're not thinking? Tell me. Well, the first thing is, what if the tree forks? Is it one tree or two trees? Okay, you have to have a procedure to deal with that. Forest service, PBA. If it forks below, it's one. If it forks above, it's two. No, I said it back. If it forks below, it's two. If it forks above, it's one. Okay, how about... What's an individual shrub? Well, if it only has a stem or two, it's not too bad. What if it was water birch and it had six red stems? It's going to become a little more subjective. What if we switch to, how many of you know choke cherry or sandbar willow? What if we get a clonal species of aspen that reproduces vegetatively? Remember, I, you've read these things. An aspen grows 10 acres and it's a gazillion year old, you know, pretty stuff like that. Okay. Now you're counting stems. And trust me, when you're counting stems, that's when you need an assistant. Because you are going to spend a lot of time counting stems. Uh, diversity is usually derived as secondary from other. But just let me ask you, and I understand you're not doing our diversity. There's two components. What are they? Well, you, you know the common one, right? It's, it's the number in a class, right? It's a number. And the second one is the relative abundance. If it's 99 and 1, that's still just two species. If it's 50-50, that's just two species. So you have to incorporate that. <clears throat> I picked this to illustrate uh, clipping or harvesting. I got to tell you. So you see my shears here. So the first, I used to have my other model was have shears will travel. Why would I have four shears? Because they break. Yeah, because they get dull, right? I spent a lot of hours doing this. And I know some people look down on it, but now if Robert and I were putting them together, we'd probably have wonderful conversations about vegetation and stuff. <laughs> and if you were the wrong person, you know, and they're thinking about some erotic thing or something, of course it's wasted time. I also point out, I wore the handles off them. Okay, see the garden hose on some of them? So I have that made enough money clipping in my life to put one of you through Harvard. I'm not going to put one of you through Harvard, but I could if I hadn't squandered all the money. But anyway. Ah, the frame. That's a cover frame. It's a big one. That's kind of I use. So we go this way. It's a meter, half meter. And then, you see that? That's 1%. See that? 5%. See that? 10%. See that? 15%. See this? 25%. So that helps you calibrate. I got to tell you, I never look at these things and the paint's pretty worn off. I can see I just painted it when I did this. Also, that, that's back when I used rebar. That's for doing coverage estimates. You draw a polygon in your mind around the plants, and, and you group them together because they're here and there, right? So that's, the detractors would say that's the mental gymnastics part. And you, it's layered, so it's called stratified. So if you have a plant above another and you count them both, you can end up with 160% cover, okay? Now if you want to relativize it, you divide the cover per species by the total cover and it always adds. So you can make it into relative cover. 
Oh, let's see. What else we got? Industrial stapler. It's at the center. This is Fiat 2H, Transect 21, Clock 5. And this says ICAG 4 grams. Introduced cool annual grass. I didn't feel like clipping it just a little bit, so I estimated it at 4 grams. Okay. So we got a cover frame, and we're talking about productivity. And there it is. <laughs> I put that on and just say, try to do that with one of these periscopes. Because the first thing is you have to be above it. Robert couldn't do it. It's a meter and a half just to the top of the vegetation, right? At least I can take that plot and lay it down on the veg, you know, and do an estimate. Also, uh, I'm going to use this for something else. It's a method that's been used for, this is Forest Habitat Types of Montana, major publication. Uh, Dobbin Meyer. And, oh, I meant to tell you. Dobbin Meyer invented it in an article in 1959 that is so full of wonderful vegetational information you know, that everyone should read it. And the title of it is A Canopy Coverage Method of Vegetational Analysis. So the first thing we find is he knows how to use the word vegetation. Whereas every moron around here is going to say for sure, vegetative. Yeah, that's right. So, great article. I'd say, Robert, if there's a handout reading that, that is really a good one. So here I'm going to do a transect. The K4 means I'm in area K transect 4. Those are just some coordinates to find there. And there's a transect is a long line. OK, so. This is a 100 meter, 100 meter tape going out through the revegetation. And that happens to be, I can tell by the revegetation, that's a, a repair job there. And that de deactivated this, Robert. Did I? Yeah, it, it deactivated the clipper. Somebody wanted to get into Zoom, and I just, yeah. I'm sorry. Okay, there's a plot with very, I told you it's a repair of very little vegetation. So you, you look in there and, and there's some alfalfa and there's some yarrow and there's some grasses. And I think that you kind of, here's the transect coming around up here. Here's a plot after you used it a while, the thing isn't so crisp. Here's another one I mentioned, the hydrology. And this, this is right here, down on Silver Hill Creek. And then sometimes I'll take a picture of the second half if I think it looks a little different than the first half. Okay, moving on. So we're talking about measuring. What is one measurement? What's an N? And we're not talking about the chromosome number. <laughs> okay, what's an N? We're doing a transect, there's 20 plots on a transect, one every five meters. The transect is one. Okay, you don't get to count the 20 plots. The plots are just things that go into the transit. Now, <clears throat> the OSM once sponsored a statistic workshop down in uh, Laramie with a really good, John Kern, became friends with a really good statistician. And there was a guy there who was working in North Dakota who used that point intercept method. And he says, I took 1,000 points in the field. What's my end? What's the answer? In his one. That is your first sample. You didn't put them into any other kind of units, like going down a transect or everything. That's it. Needless to say, he was crestfallen. So this is very important, and it's important. How many of you guys took statistics? How many of you know more statistics than me? All of you? No, maybe not all of you. Okay. And it's going to come up in a number of calculations. Another thing that I think you have to always remember when you're doing vegetation, you have to put it into a precipitation context if you're in a semi-arid environment. So semi-arid, does anybody know what that is? It's what we're in here. It starts at about 10 inches. That's arid if you're under 10 inches. I can't, I'm not sure what the upper part is where it gets messy or something, but this is where I always work. So out of this mine, the 80s was the dry time, 
and it kept going up. This is a kind of unusual. So somewhere around here, the paper was making a big to-do like they always do about the drought. You know what a drought is? That's 70% or less of the average precipitation for two consecutive years. That's how I learned it anyway. Now, it's three dry weeks, baby. That's all it takes. And I said, you know, just so you know, the 80s is when Spring Creek dried up. He gives me this look like, you are so deluded, man. And that's when I started to get in this day and say, you know, this is how it's been. The mine's been getting moisture and moisture. So you would expect the productivity to go up and up, right? Because you're getting more precipitation. And just to show you, there's some shrub density data. And in field age, it's across the bottom. So density versus field age and it's declining. You think that's common or uncommon? pretty common. Unless you have something, a spreading shrub, like we were talking about choke cherry or sandbar willow or something, that's pretty common. Now, DEQ Coral Bureau, their model is, Robert's going to love this because it was the same model for something they did here. If we just get some islands, they'll spread. I said, no, that's not how it works. Well, that's what we believe. And they do not like seeing this. And really, they don't like that. They much prefer their notions. To what you actually find. So if somebody, if I say shrub density tends to decline with time, and you say, I call bullshit on you, Rich. You have data to support that? I say, well, you bet I do. Fields up to 9 to 11 years old. Oh, I'll just mention for a sentence. Um, so it's been said that I've monitored more vegetate, more revegetation than anybody in Montana, more coal, more hard rock. And I'm not so sure about Super fun. But if you said measured vegetation, not fills out some evaluation page, maybe for that too. So at least I have some bona fides um, to talk about this. Somebody here, tell me you know. One first. You shouldn't be able to get out of college. I've never seen a tie before. Okay. Robert, did I mention that I always get to ask you a question on the test? No. Ah. But ah, you should. <laughs> yeah, there's something for you to think about. This could be a hell of a question on a test, especially if you have to answer it in one sentence for each point. Well, there's four levels of measurement, and this is, this is critical stuff to know. The first is nominal, and you can read it. You get the idea with the eye color, right? Statistics focused on frequency counts. That's a histogram, for example, is a frequency count. Okay. A chi square or binomial expansion, we won't worry about them today. Now, we could do that in this room, right? And do that. What would ruin it? What would ruin it if somebody says, well, my eyes are kind of a hazel with onyx flex or something? No, 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 no. Everything has to go into one of the categories, right? Your eyes are green, your eyes are blue, your eyes are brown. It has to be clear cut. And, and I, just at some level, everything is unique, OK? Nominal. In, that means in name only. Next is ordinal or red. Now they're not just different, but you have a relation of greater or less than. Don't worry about the next part. <laughs> and then the, the median, everybody remembers what the median is? What is the median? The middle. So is the mean. The median is half the values above and half the below. That's the one you want to use about income so that if Bill Gates walks in, the median income goes up by a trillion dollars and the median is almost the same because half above and half below. Now Robert's taller than me, right? But we don't know how much. That's all this tells you. Robert's taller? I'm sure. Okay. Something pretty interesting about this as it's misused. So let's say we, we take the, the usual ones uh, poor, fair, good, excellent. Some reason it's usually four. Those are ordinal. Okay. This is better than that. This is better than that. Okay. What if we change that to one, two, three, four? Well, it's the same thing, right? One, two, three, four. But there's something important to remember. Three is not three times one. 
is it? And two is not half of four. They're just ordinal data. The big thing that you have to remember is, if, oops, if you combine measurements but lose the units, it's no more than a length. Now there's a thing that they developed at great cost, I heard over 50,000, DRES, whatever, land evaluation system here for Butte. There's not a measurement in it, I don't think. And it takes stuff like, what's the plant cover? Well, you got me, nobody measured it. Okay, how about the erosion? Woo! Trust me, you want to get into some grunt work. It's easier to do it in sediment basins than, than it is measuring it out. In anyway, nope, that's in there. How about trash? Yeah, let's throw in some trash into there and see what we come up with. And then they come up with a number, 120 or something. Then it's okay. There, this is pseudo quantification. There's not a unit in the whole freaking thing. There's not really a measurement in the whole thing. So I'm kind of teaching you a little skepticism. Moving on, the first currently quantitative scale is the interval. And now we have a scale and each separation, each unit in it is the same. So temperature is one. Actually, there's not a ton of them. The ratios are good. You can add, subtract, anything like that. But it's missed. Okay, let's just check this. Parametric statistics such as a t-test. Somebody tell me what a t-test is. I'm sorry? The difference in the the difference from a, a middle point. A t-test compares, it could be used compared to a standard, but it compares two sets of data with two means. And if the confidence interval overlaps, they're considered the same. You can't conclude that right. they're different. Okay, that's, that's a t-test. What's an f-test? Anybody do analysis of variance in here? I know. Yeah. It's kind of the same thing. It tells you if it's significant. You set a level and it says if it's going to be significant. Okay. And then finally, the ratio scale, what we all have been waiting for, weight, height. Now you can say Robert is X inches. We could say it was X percent taller than me because we're at a scale that we can do that with. The main thing is to be cautious when you don't really have the level of precision you thought you Here's a good one. What's the statistical? There's ecological and, and uh, statistical considerations. What's the statistical goal of sample? Why would you sample? You can gather data to base future efforts on. You need to know what's out there if you're going to do Would I sample this room? Uh, depending on what your goal is, maybe. It has to be a goal of being really quick, because why wouldn't I just count you? Okay, so sampling, you sample when there are too many things to fully interpret. Okay, right? That makes sense. Uh, but now the statistical goal of sampling. To be representative of I already told you, I can't read your lips. I'm sorry, but I'll, I'll just answer it, okay? So You're probably right, I, I, but I can't hear it. Okay, what we want in sampling is we want the population mean, the whole population mean, average, to be the same as the sample mean. That would be wonderful. That's exactly what we want, to get that in a fewer number of samples. When you saw those, those pictures I had on my transects, there's a million plants out there, right? And I'm just sampling, oh, think of this, point intercept. You get all done and you've measured this much. You know? So this is a big issue. I said that, statistical and ecological. So usually when we approach vegetation, revegetation, maybe it's all homogeneous. What does that mean? It's all the same. Pretty much the same. It's all pretty much the same. And maybe it's like really different. So maybe you'd say, well, I have some revegetation that's as has a fair amount of shrubs. So I have some that doesn't have any. And if we sample it all together, I told you I was going to use this shower. If we sample it all together, this is what we're going to get. It's big and broad, and it has a lot in the tails. Okay, and that's what we use for the conference. Okay, so if we stratify it, 
We're going to say, no, I recognize two things. We have a shrub type and a grass type. And the grass type has almost no shrubs, and the shrub type has a lot of shrubs. And so when we plot um, shrub density, we're going to have a, a, fair, a lot tighter beam for one, and one that's all like, you know, way down at the bottom, like that. Okay? <clears throat> so stratification is, the, is one of the first things you've got to think of when you start. And you probably would, but you might not know the word. But you know, if you have forest and you had grassland, you're probably not going to go out and, and say, well, the average has so many trees, but half of it has none, and the other end has twice as much, right? OK, I skipped around on this, but we're going through the time anyway. How do you locate sample location? And you want, remember I said sampling, you want to represent the population, but you also want it to represent the population variance, okay, the variance around the mean. Well, there's two basic ways to do it. It's random it's, uh, and systematic sample locations. Who knows what random is? Uh, that's tough. Each spot has an equal chance probability of being picked, even the same spot. Okay, that's what it means. Now, it looks fudge. There's a lot of problems with random, but they're all practical problems. They're not theoretical problems. So if you have an area, where do you, what do you think the samples randomly would look like? You might make a transect and then... Would it look like that? Hell no. Definitely wouldn't. What is half of that area? Half of that area is on the outside. This blows your mind when you first do it. So half your samples better be out of here. Okay? When you look at it, your first impression is something's wrong, all the samples are on the edges. Well, that's the way the cookie crumbles. Okay? The reason that, uh, ra and random is, you know, that's the gold standard, no doubt about it. What if I said, I've already spent all the time in the office. Go to that point. Yeah, that's going to take a while, right? You're going to have to have your UTM coordinates or whatever. You're going to spend a lot of time getting from A to B, and then you're, you're going to be thinking, what's next? How am I going to do this? I don't want to get all done, and you know, I'm back here, and I forgot to ask, and stuff like that. These are overcomable, but I'm just telling you there's some problems with doing that. Now, it's a guard against bias, which is huge. Samples are independent. A good sample here, is, and the next sample could be two feet away, or it could be 200 yards away. And it's laborious, etc. You need at least 10 to get started on this, and it may look funny. Uh, this is kind of interesting. While the samples may be randomly located, the sampling of individuals may be far from random because the, the, this, the uh, I don't want to say distribution, the location of patches of plants are often contagious. So a whole bunch of them is missing. The plants aren't scattered randomly to match your random sample. Okay? Next is systematic sampling. And I can show you this as fast as you can read that. Typically, you do something like that. You say, we start here, and then we go like this. And then we move over here. OK. It's fast. It's easy. Some statisticians say it's OK. What's wrong with this map now? Have you seen a random one? There's not a plot near the edge, is there? And that often happens because you start and you move in. Well, that set the pattern. Everybody's going to be in a row, OK? Now, there is a way where you can go up here, where this would have been, and offset at 90 degrees. And there's some other ways you can do it with a, a thing called a random walk. But anyway, <clears throat> what is no good? It's the thing that students love to do the most. They love to throw hoops and stuff in the air. They do. I know they do. Why isn't that in the day? The hoop's going to stop when it hits a bush, isn't it? 
What if you throw in it rolls? Where's it going to stop? It's going to stop when it hits a bush. Okay, so you can introduce bias with, with that. I got, my first time when I was in college, I did something with hoops too. It, you know, it's fun to do. It's not a good way to do it. How do they compare? I think we've pretty much done that. Now, there's one thing that's no good. That's when somebody tells you that they just pick the sample locations. What they're really telling you is, I can give you the mean without all those extra samples. I can do, I can do it quickly because I know with the vegetation. But they probably don't, and you're certainly not going to get the variance, are you? So just be, how do you say, I would just reject that. If somebody comes in here and tells you I just picked the sample location, say, Interesting, but it probably doesn't have anything to do with the average condition out there. Okay. This is a big, big question. How many samples are necessary? Now suppose, despite what I said earlier, I did decide to sample this class. What if I, did I meet you on the river? You did, yes. There you go. What if I, he was my sample. What color are your eyes? Green. That's the answer. Great. Wait a minute. That sample's too small, isn't it? We have to get more samples than we can do that. I could sample four of you. Eh, I don't think so. I don't think that's good. Actually, you know, this group probably have to sample almost everybody before we got a good answer to that. And this is important for any parameter or parameters and attribute to quantify anything reliably, like in a permitting process and stuff like that, actually for research too and so on. Now one way is to graph it. I got to tell you, I like this. It's not statistical. This is something that we're measuring the parameter. And this is the number of samples down here. So in the first sample, it lands up there. What's the next sample? Who knows? Let's say it's here. All right? But instead of plotting that, what if we average those two and put it up there? And then when we take the third sample, we bring that, now it's divided by three. Okay? So what you find is your graph goes like this. Now, whatever else is going on, we do learn that there comes a point where more samples are not giving us a better estimate of the mean. That's huge. I, that's why I like this. What's no good about it? Anybody thinking along these lines? Uh, if you're, uh, what if, excuse me, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, if your number of samples gets so high, it, you can't pay for that amount of samples. Well, that. That could happen, but it won't happen in that. No matter what happens, that one's going to level out. Okay? But you're getting, okay, but now let, let's say this. What if we had a bimodal distribution? So instead of this, we had this. And we had another one like this. Where's the mean? It's right where there's nothing, isn't it? Okay? So, this will actually handle that, but it's not right. You have to stratify. A bimodal distribution is bad news because all your statistics don't apply to you, even the mean, nothing applies to it. You're working with two basically different data sets. Actually, I got a little bit more on that. But anyway, that's one way. And there's a statistical way. So n min, that's the minimum number of samples. It's t squared. What's t? Anybody know what t is? It's so important to know what t is. This is my tatum I was using today. I feel like I'm drawing a lot because I can't see anything with this map. Well, oh, it's in the back. Your basic rain sheet. Vegetative characteristics of grass. It's the basic stuff everybody carries. This is a table of T. That's how often I use it. So the T distribution is a 
different distribution for each end, each item. So I'm going to pass that around because I hear some stuff that kind of makes it clear what it is. So you have some preliminary data. You need to have some data to get started with it. And we know what the end, we're calculating the end then, and the t is going to be t squared for your data set. The s squared is, what's that one word? S is standard deviation, s squared is? Variance, right? That's a variance. And the bottom is c, some number. Now this is going to be a percent of the mean because mu is the sample mean, okay? Point, it could be 0.2, it could be 0.1, it could even be 0.05. But usually I use like point one, and you're saying I want to be this close to the true mean and run these calculations. But if you have this, the answer will be a sample forever. They'll tell you to take 180 samples when you get that and we'll calculate it, let's say do 250. The mean stopped changing a long time ago. Okay. Okay, quickly, type one error is everybody got to spit this out. Type one error. You think there's a difference, but there isn't. Take one error, okay? If you set it too high, you're going to conclude everything's the same, which happens more often than you think. What's type two error? It's just the opposite, right? You conclude they're different, but it's not, okay? Now, if you're too conservative for type one, what's the outcome? How many of you took statistics ever heard the word power? Ah, oh, good for you. I'm, I shake hands with your statistics teacher. What is it? It's, uh, it's yeah. part of the, it's the probability the of the ability to detecting a difference yeah. if one exists. Okay? You, you guys are all too young. You're just show cool man, remember? Group, group. Okay, we like power. We like power. How do you get power? Well, first power plus type, type 2 error is 1. So that's relation. To get power, you want a difference, bigger difference between the means? Well, yeah, you don't get to pick that. There it is. And increase the sample size. Ends in it in the numerator, and through the T, it's in the denominator, too and accept type more type one error. So what's a confidence interval? That's one way that you would compare means. Now you guys are going to think I just boned up for this, but a confidence interval is, is uh, f plus or minus t times s over the square root of n. I could say that in my sleep. I, I used to do about a gazillion of these, and I was doing them for toll where this stuff matters. So a confidence interval is the basis we were saying for a t-test, for example. We're seeing if those confidence intervals overlap. Oh, I, maybe I'm getting too much statistics, but I'm hoping you get an idea that there's a lot more than, than just going out. And, uh, and, and one thing I, I don't want to forget, the heyday of measurements was around when I was born. Okay, that's when lots of publications about how to make. And they went to such extremes, one of them had a pantograph. It basically drew the plot. Well, I think clearly we say that's a little more information than we really need, you know, to draw the plot and stuff. And now, it's almost like it didn't matter. People make up, I can't believe it. People make up stuff. They just go out and say, I. I measured like this, I used to take measure and I measured this the, the, across the canopy or something like that. But anyway, I wanted you to know that the standard and the statistics is part, remember I said ecological and statistical. You have to have both of them in your consideration. And why did I put that? Okay. The confidence interval is determined by the variance measures heterogeneity and inherent property population property sample and the number of samples. There it is. Both is the denominator, the square root of n, and it's the student's t in the numerator. Now, 
we go out and collect a bunch of data. We set, we set a line how to do it. Hey, what's the number one error you usually see in plant data? Vegetation. It's misidentification. <laughs> how many people can identify even 100 species? Even in your garden, right? Okay, <laughs> it's your half weeks. <clears throat> okay. So, <clears throat> again, if we, so let's say we sampled by the species. Sampled by the species, what would you put in an alphabetical order? Even Robert or I would have to take a long time looking through that to even know if it was a grass community or a shrub community or a wetland community. Their grass are up, they're off when 10 ounces is down at the bottom. Arabus confinus is at the top. So you're going to, again, stratify. You're going to put the plants into what? Some kind of groups, right? OK. Give me some groups. Give me, just give me one group. Well, oh, I, I dare bring this up now. I like the classic stuff. Let's see how good Robert is. I told him I'd have to put up embarrassing. Name two of Ron Pierre's. Therophytes, Panerophytes, and <coughs> Epiphytes, and oh. Therophyta, the annuals, Geophyta. It's all about the position yeah, of geophyta. Yeah. But Geophyta, tubers, rhizomes, and so on. Epicryptophyta would be the bunch grasses. Cameophyta would be the subshrubs. And then the phanerophytes. Nanophanerophyte, the littlest ones. Uh, Microphanerophyte, mesophanerophyte, macrophanerophyte. That's really the only way to use that word, life form. Or we could use, I should have put it, I should have had a slide, growth forms, where you get to define them yourself. OK? I was hoping somebody would say grasses. Is that good? It did. I did. Might be good enough for you. How about? Maybe perennial grasses. No, no, no. I don't think that's good. How about warm season perennial grasses? Oh, yes, that's better. But how about native warm, warm season perennial grasses? Well, you can. It's all up to you. It's all it depends on what you want. When I did it for coal, we had a million on my. When I said I C H E introduced cool annual grass, there was warms and uh, not introduced and so. So anyway, this is how you would typically stratify the grass. Now, believe it or not, we're running out of time, so it's perfect. I didn't bring one of my reports full of millions of tables. And I also, like I showed you here, I also take pictures. The average person, you're lucky if you get them to read your executive summary. So write a good executive summary up front, right? And they're going to they're going to again flip all the way back to the pictures and see what you got. I'm just telling you the voice of experience. So you make up all these tables. But you could look at here and say, I see we got transects, we got hydrology, and then we got four years of data. This one is doing perennial canopy coverage. And we see, geez, that's great. Well, I look over here and it says repairs. Okay. I look at this one here and it says, you know what? Never got that great. And you can look at this one, wonderful. It says good alfalfa grass and repair. Well, as soon as you get alfalfa, you're going to have a lot of cover and so on. Anyway, that's one. And you know, just to show you one way that you could some. Now, what could we have done to make that better? We could have put a confidence interval down there, and then you know, if we could really conclude if 85 is bigger than 66. And sometimes I do. I kind of threw this together for you. Here's one that's on shrub density. Why couldn't you put a confidence interval on this one? Well, you can't guess 20,000. This is because I didn't have an assistant. Somebody had to count those stems, right? You can't count 20,000. I said, yeah, it's more than 10,000, because that would grossly influence everything from it. But this is just uh, a way to summarize your data. So we come back to Chippy. Right at 5 o'clock. There you go. And I didn't even time. Thank you. If someone has 